Amen. The title of the sermon this morning is, or this evening is Doing Things God's Way. Doing Things God's Way. And what I want us to get from the sermon is that we must learn how God wants things done, and then we must do them the way that, that, that God wants things done. And we see here this example of David is <clears throat> somebody who learned from his failures and mistakes. He's the one who is somebody who failed to do things God's way, God's way and then learned to do things God's way. And I think he's a good example because of the fact that we as sin, as sinners, we as, you know, as as just the flesh that we are in, we we are going to make mistakes. We are going to fail. Um, you know, we try to minimize that. But we have to be careful today because there's people out there that will tell you, you know, that if you're if you're truly born again, you know, if you're saved, that you are to strive to attain to some sinless perfection, and that people will teach you that there's some there's you can reach a level where you no longer sin anymore. You know, that these people are out there. And that's just a that's a that's a not true, and it's dangerous. And what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for an even bigger fall. You know, it's a person who realizes that they have feet of clay. It's the person who realizes that they are capable of sin that is going to do better. That they're the ones that are going to be more careful. They're the ones that are going to exercise more discretion and judgment and caution in their life and trying to uh, minimize the amount of sin that is able to creep into their life, minimize the mistakes that they make, and spare themselves uh, any suffering as, as a result. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24, I'll read for you, it says, For a just man falleth seven times, and rise up, riseth up again. You know, the just man, the one who is justified, you know, the one who is saved, the one who is born again, he is going to fall. In fact, the Bible says here, a just man falleth seven times. He didn't fall just once or twice, he falled many times. He falled multiple times. But the Bible says that he riseth up again. And he goes on to say, but the wicked falleth into mischief. Both of these men fell. One rose, one didn't. Well, what, what, what makes the difference there? I believe the Bible tells us the difference between the two in Proverbs 28 where it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. There's that phrase again. The wicked shall fall into mischief. The one that hardens his heart shall fall into mischief. He does not rise again like the just man. Because the just man is the one that realizes that he has to confess his sin. That he has to forsake his sin. He's the one that's going to say, I have fallen, I have erred, I have made a mistake, I have sinned against God, and confess it and ask for forgiveness. And he, the Bible says, shall receive mercy. He that confess, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. But it's the wicked man, he won't do that. He's going to fall into mischief and say, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. You see, the wicked, he that hardens his heart, he's the one that doesn't rise again. They both fall. They both make the mistakes, but one is willing to say, you know what, I've fallen, I'm sorry, I've done wrong, and he is able to rise up because of the mercy of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, Such is the way of an adulterous woman, she eateth and wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. The truly wicked person is somebody who's not ever, you know, is somebody who would never be willing to admit wrongdoing. That's an evil and wicked heart to say, you know, I've never made a mistake. I've done no wrong, as this woman has said. I mean, the picture that the, that, that it's 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 painting there, it, it, you know, it's kind of it, it's kind of shocking. It says, such is the way of an adulterous woman, I and mean, that's a wicked sin. She wipe she eateth and wipeth her mouth. I mean, she sits down and eats like nothing happened, like it's just another day. You know, she might have gone and wrecked some home, ruined some life, destroyed some family, and she just sits down and eats, and she wipes her mouth and gets up and says, "I have done no wickedness." Well, that woman has fallen. You know, and she is going to suffer the consequences, and she will have no mercy. <clears throat> the Bible says in First John, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know, we're not fooling anybody else. You ever run into that person out soul winning and says, hey, well, you say, hey, you know, we're all sinners. You say, well, not me. And it's very rare, but I've actually met people like that. and say, well, I don't sin. I don't sin. They're not fooling me. You know, I know what the Bible says. The only person they're fooling is themselves. They're not fooling God. God sees them. And, there, and the Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not on us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the difference between the just man who's able to fall and rise seven times. He has the humility to say, you know what? Forgive me, Lord Jesus. To confess, to forsake, 
and that, and 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 understand and, and and rest upon the promise that God is just and that, and that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. The just man, he that conf confesses his sin, is the one that rises again and finds mercy. And I believe as we do that, as we go through our Christian lives and we grow and we and we, we make mistakes and we fall and we confess and we and we rise again. We begin to experience the mercy and the grace of God in our lives. In that process, we start to learn about God's character. We start to learn some things about the way God is. And one of the first things that we learn is that God is merciful. And that's an attribute that God uh, ascribes to Himself in the Word. That He is, that he is long-suffering. That He is ever merciful. And that He's quick and ready to forgive. We learn in that process that God is merciful. But we also learn that He expects things done a certain way. We start to learn, well, what I, why is it that I fell here? Why is it that I made this mistake? It's because I didn't understand how God wanted things done. I didn't realize that this was something that God disapproved of. Or I didn't realize God wanted this certain thing done in another way. That's something else we'll learn. Not only will we learn that He's merciful and kind and, will, and willing and ready to forgive, but also learn along the way that He wants things done a certain way. And I believe David here in this story, 1 Chronicles 13 and 14, we'll see that, that David is someone who made a mistake and then he learned that God wanted things done a certain way. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 1, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds, and with every leader. And he said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and if it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad to our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in the cities and the, and the, and the suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not it at the days of Saul. So David here is actually wanting a good thing. I mean, his heart is probably in the right place, wouldn't you say? He wants the ark of God, you know, taken out of those heathen lands. He wants it back in its homeland. He wants to be able to inquire at it. But that's really where he makes his first mistake, is he forgets that he should have begun inquiring in the first place with God. Because what does it say in verse 1? It says, He consulted with the captains and thousands and hundreds and with every leader. He didn't consult with God. He didn't inquire of the Lord. Lord, I'd like, I want to bring the ark back. How, what would you have me to do? How are we to do this? What's the process here? Does this, would this please you? No, he goes, his heart's in the right place, yes. But he doesn't take the time to find out the way God wants things done. And he goes to every leader. You see, the Lord often, that ought to be the first person we ask. When we're wondering about what's God's will in this situation, what does God want me to do in this situation, what does God, you know, it's great to go to God and the counsel, you know, the multitude of counselors, there is safety, the Bible says. It's great if we're surrounded by people who know the Bible or have lived a Christian life, people that have experienced certain things that we can go to and ask wise counsel of. But they should, be the set, they should not be the first people we go to. They should be a very close second but the first person we need to go to is the Lord. We need to go to the Lord and ask Him in prayer and to have, ask Him to show us in His Word what it is that He expects in this, situa in this situation. The Lord should be the first person we ask, and that's where David went wrong here. And you have to wonder when he went to these leaders, what, what, was the, what kind of advice did he really get? What was the quality of the advice? You know, did any of these leaders suggest to David to inquire of the Lord? Did it say, hey David, maybe you should go ask God? No, it's not, it sounds like they just said, yeah, David, go ahead. That sounds good. Why don't, you, why don't we get everybody together? We'll get the Levites and everybody, and we'll, and we'll bring again the ark. We'll, we'll gather all the people together. That sounds good. Let's do it. We'll, we'll kind of figure out as we go along. You know, we'll, we'll find a cart, and we'll draw it out, and, and we'll, just, we'll just do whatever. I mean, after all, the point is we're just trying to get the ark back. Who cares how we do it? We just, we're trying to do a good thing. You know, we'll make application to some specifics in our life a little bit later in the sermon, but, you know, apply that where you will, whatever area of your life. Hey, it doesn't matter how I do it as long as I just do this. You know, that we have to be careful that we're doing things God's way, especially leaders like David. They must take it upon themselves to seek God's leading. They have to look for what God wants them to do, how He wants them to do it. You see, good intentions and enthusiasm do not make void God's method. Just because your heart's in the right place, just because you're enthusiastic about it, just because you're well-intentioned, just because you think you're doing the right thing, if you're not doing it the right way, that's, that's going to be a problem. You don't just get, you, you, it doesn't make it the way, uh, void God's methods. God still wants things done a certain way. The Bible says there in verse 6, 
And David went up and all Israel to Bela, that is Kirjath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of the Lord, and that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose names is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart. In a new cart. Now, if you recall, we're going to get into this. That's not how they were to do it. They carried out the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drave the cart, and David and Israel played before the Lord with all their might. I mean, these guys are enthusiastic. They're excited about what they're doing. So they, hey, here comes the ark, and they played with all their might. They had all the, the instruments out, singing and harps and psalteries and timbrels and cymbals and with trumpets. I mean, this was a big to-do. They've got all, the, all these people, got a lot of eyes on the situation, a lot of people you know, cheering them on. It was like, a, like a, a big parade, it sounds like. They're making a big deal out of it. You know, the ark's coming back. It's been gone. We didn't acquire it all the days of Saul. Let's get this thing back in the, where it belongs. Good intentions, a lot of enthusiasm, but they're not doing it right. <clears throat> you see, in verse 7, amidst all of that, all that pomp, amidst all of that, you know, show, everything that just would, man would look at and say, wow, what a day. Wow, look at the symbols, listen to the trumpet, look at, look at how they, they're dancing and singing and playing with all their might. Look at the ark, how beautiful it is. Isn't this great? Amidst all of that that was going on. It was verse 7 that caught God's eye. The Bible says in verse 7, and they carried the ark of God in a new cart. God looked down and saw all that. He said, wait a minute, what's this? What are you doing right here? That's not how I told you to do it. Let's go ahead and see how they were supposed to do it. You see, God's not going to get distracted by all, all, the, all the puff and all the pomp and everything that, that man puts on and all the enthusiasm that we get worked up. But go ahead and turn over to Numbers chapter 4. He's not going to get distracted by that and neglect the details, the things that He told us to do. You see, the Lord had given very specific details concerning the moving of the ark over in Numbers chapter 4. We're going to read some scripture here. Numbers chapter 4 and verse 1. Pay attention here, because God, see how specific and how detailed God gets when it comes to moving the ark. He says in Numbers chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi after their families by the house of their fathers from 30 years old even up, upward even until 50 years old all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle, tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. And when, they camp, and when the camp setteth forward Aaron shall come and his sons and they shall take down the, the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it and shall put there on the covering of badger skins and shall spread a cloth, split, spread to it a cloth holy of blue and shall put in the staves thereof. And upon the table of the showbread they shall spread a cloth of blue and put there on the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and to cover with all and the, and the continual bread shall be thereon. And they shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet and cover the same with this covering of badger skins, and shall put in the staves thereof. And they shall take a cloth of blue, and cover the candlestick of the light, and his lamps, and his tongs, and his snuff dishes, and all the oil vessels thereof, wherewith they minister unto it. And they shall put, put it, and they shall put it, and all the vessels thereof, within a covering of badger skins, and shall put it upon a bar. And upon the golden article shall they spread a cloth of blue, and cover it with the covering of badger skins, and put two the staves thereof. And they should take all the instruments of ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary, and put them in a cloth of blue, and cover them with the covering of badger skins, and put them upon a bar. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar, and spread a cloth, a purple cloth of thereon. And they shall put upon it all the vessels thereof, <coughs> wherewith they minister about it, even the censers, and the flesh hooks, and the shovels, and the basins, all the vessels of the altar, and they shall spread upon it a covering of badger skins and put it to the staves thereof. God was very specific down to what color the cloth was going to be. It's going to be blue. It's going to be purple. It's going to be scarlet. It's going to be the cloth. Then the badger skins. Then this. Then that. You're going to put this here. You're going to put that there. He's very specific about the details. But they, do they do the, any of this? Is this how they move the ark? I mean, the ark was the very first thing that he tells them about. And he says, And when the camp said, For an Aaron shall come, and his sons to you, Take down the covering veil, and cover the ark of the testimony, this is verse 5, with it. They were to take the veil between the most holy and the holy place, 
sons of Aaron were to take it down and cover it, that veil over it. And then they were to put upon the covering of badger skins and spread it over a cloth, holy of blue, and put in the staves thereof. And that's how they were to carry it. And it was to be the sons of Kohath. He said, hey, the sons of Kohath, from 30 to 50 years old, this is going to be their job to move these holy things. And this is how they're to move it. Not on a new cart. You see, God wasn't impressed with everything. He was more concerned about how things were getting done. The Lord had given very specific details concerning the moving of the ark. You see, and they learned very quickly here, and unfortunately, that disregarding God's directions, it comes with consequences. God's not just going to go, well, you know, I prefer it you did it this way. You know, I know I asked you to do it that way, but that's okay. Do it however you want. No, God said, this is the way I want it done. Do it this way. And it comes with consequences when we disregard the way things God wants done. We're doing things the way God wants things done. Look at verse 9. And when they came under the threshing floor, or verse 9, I'm sorry, I should have told you to keep something there in 1 Corinthians, or uh, not 1 Corinthians, where, where did I have you go? 1 Chronicles 13, 1 Chronicles 13. Just keep something in 1 Chronicles if I have you move again. And we're going to be back in Numbers 4, so keep that in mind as well. So first, for 1 Chronicles 13 and Numbers 4, I need you to stay there. But if you go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and you look at verse 9, we'll see the consequences that came when they disregarded the, um, the directions that God had given them. I mean, were those not very specific directions? Could not God not have been any clearer about the way He wanted it moved? Who He wanted to move it? What He wanted on it? And when and where they were to move it? <clears throat> it says in verse 9 of 1 Chronicles 13, And when they came under the threshing, threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. It wasn't, and it wasn't even that Uzzah was curious. I wonder what the ark feels like. Or he didn't want to go, Hey, I want to go back and say, Hey, I touched the ark. You know, it was because the oxen stumbled. He was concerned. He was worried that the that the uh, that the the ark was going to fall off on the ground. You know how and how embarrassing that would have been to him. You know, he wanted to stop it and put his hand to it. Yeah, his intentions were good, weren't they? In verse ten, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. Now, remember we talked about Bible reading this morning? This is one of those shocking stories. Wow, God killed a guy for just touching the ark? He did. And there's a reason why. The Bible says in verse 11, And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Therefore, they called, the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And you say, that's pretty harsh of God. Wow, that's, that's a pretty stiff punishment for just touching the ark. But when we think about it, God was already cutting them a lot of slack. And you'll see here in a minute just how much slack was God, in these, God was cutting these people. Because I'm telling you right now, these people weren't even to be looking at the ark, let alone touching it. Uzzah never should have laid his eyes upon the ark, let alone touched it. If you're still there in Numbers 4, turn back. Numbers 4. They weren't even to see the ark. David shouldn't have been looking at it. Most of the people there shouldn't have been looking at it. Very few people in the Bible were allowed to look at the ark. It says there in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 18. Numbers 4.18 says, Cut ye not off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites. Now remember in the beginning of the chapter, it was the Kohathites that were to move everything, right? Well, how are you going to move something without them looking at it? And now, here, and now here he is saying in verse 18, cut ye not off the tribe. You know what cut ye off means? It means don't kill them. He says, hey look, don't kill the Kohathites. He says, I don't want these guys to die. Cut ye not off the tribe of the family of the Kohathites from among the Levites, but thus do unto them that they may live and not die, like, like Uzzah did, right? When they approach unto the most holy things, Aaron and his son shall go in, not the Kohathites. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint unto every one his burden and, uh, and, and uh, every one to his service and to his burden. But they shall not go in to see the holy things that are covered, lest they die. They were not to go in and see it. See, if you remember in the story, Aaron and his sons were the ones that were to take down the covering and cover the ark and put the badger skins on and put the cloth on. It makes sure everything was covered so that when the sons of Kohathites came to grab that thing by the staves that were put therein, 
that they would not see it, lest they die. He's saying, don't kill them. I don't want these guys to see it, because it was only Aaron and his sons that were to ever see the ark. It was very select people. So really, when we read this story back in 1 Chronicles 13, and we say, wow, God killed a man for, for touching the ark. Well, hey, you know what? God didn't kill everybody for looking at it, which they were not supposed to do. God already cut them quite a bit of slack, Say. They put it on a new cart, and they had some oxen ha dra dragging the thing out. And they say, well, maybe they didn't know. They had the Bible. They knew this. They had all this written down. This is one of the first things God gave them in the Word. It said, hey, this is how I want it done. And they just completely disregarded it. Maybe some of them didn't know, but some of them certainly should have known. <clears throat> you see, God should have killed Uzzah just for looking at the ark. What does it say in verse 12? Go ahead and turn back to 1 Chronicles 13. The Bible says, And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not, brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. <laughs> now David has the right attitude, doesn't he? This is saying David fumed, he got bitter and angry, and said, How dare God? Uzzah was my buddy. You know, we were trying to do something for God. What was wrong about the way we were doing things, Lord? It doesn't say that. It says, what does it say there, verse 12? And, God, and David was afraid of God. That's what a story like this should put into our hearts, a fear of God, of knowing that God, you know, He wants things done a certain way. And if we just get loose in our life and just feel like we can just, you know, do whatever we want, or maybe we're doing this, so it's okay if we go and do some bad things, you know, maybe we're going to church and we're going soul winning, so now it's okay for me to go out and commit this sin. God will understand. God will give me some grace. Think again. God, the proper attitude should be fear. We should say, wow, God is not to be trifled with. God is somebody that takes things very seriously. And David has the right attitude. He got his heart right. But at what price? Uzzah. That's what it took. It took a man had to die before David got the fear that he should have had in the very beginning. When he got the idea to move the ark in the first place, he should have said, let's make sure we do this right. He should have had that fear then. It would have, Uzzah still would have been around. Probably a good guy, Uzzah. Uzzah, Uzzah, I keep going back and forth. I don't know which one's right. But he might have been around. He might have made that. What if that guy had a wife and kids? What it cost him? You know, that's why it's important for leaders, you know, men in our homes, you know, even moms, leading children, they need to make sure that they have that right attitude, that fear to making sure they're doing things right. Not after the consequences, but so that those consequences never have to come. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs 9, I'll read for you, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So David's got some fear in him now. And now he's able to start to get some wisdom. Because when we see we have a fear of the Lord, when we have a, 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 you know, a reverence for God and a fear of God, we're really, that's when I think God is ready to start imparting to us some wisdom. Where he's starting to say, okay, now I'll start to teach you some things. Because you're not so puffed up and full of yourself to think that you've got it all figured out. That you understand that, you know, there's consequences for doing something wrong. You've got some fear in your heart, and now I can start to teach you. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if you would, uh, turn over to First Chronicles chapter 14, just one, one page over. And David, in you know, 1 Chronicle 14, this, this thing happens. This happens. Uzzah dies. They turn the ark into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And God starts blessing Obed-Edom. And that's really another interesting sermon, that the fact that God will bless a Gittite, if we recall. You know, uh, the Philistine of, uh, of Gath, was, he was the Gittite. You know, Goliath was a Gittite. So here's God blessing you know, a, a heathen nation, a heathen man living in a heathen nation, a man who was not of the children of Israel for having the ark in his house. That's another kind of a separate thing. But that kind of takes place, and David just kind of goes back to Jerusalem. You know, he, he married, the Bible says there he kind of marries a multitude of wives. He's just kind of going about his life. If you recall, he ends the chapter kind of saying, well, how, you know, how shall we bring the ark of God into the in, back? How, shall we, how are we going to do this? He didn't really know. He just puts the ark away, stops what they're doing. You know, at least he had enough sense to stop. At least he had enough sense to say, whoa, we must not be doing something right. Let's put this aside and not do it anymore until we figure out how to do it right. That's a, that's a good philosophy. 
But then I think, you know, because he had that fear and God recognized, okay, now David start, he's ready to learn the lesson I want him to learn. And the lesson that he wanted him to learn from all this is that God wants things done a certain way. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 8. You know, David's back in Jerusalem, kind of living out his life. Things are moving along. And the Bible says in verse 8, 1 Chronicles 14, it says, And when the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek David. And David heard of it and went out against them. And the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God. And David inquired of God. Who's the first person he goes to? He's starting to learn his lesson. He's got a problem on his hands. He's got something he's not sure how to handle. The Philistines have come up. They've spread themselves in the valley. A worthy adversary. Someone that he's been, they've been going back and forth with. You know, people, I mean, the Philistines, if you recall, in David's early life, were, were whipping Israel. It wasn't until David showed up and defeated Goliath that they were able to do anything about him. So here's this, this, this adversary, this worthy adversary that's come back. And David, the king, has the right attitude because he's finally got some fear in his heart. But how does God want things done? What's he do in verse 10? And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Look, Lord, do you even want me to go do this? I wonder if he would... Have, why didn't he ask that back in, in the beginning of chapter 13? Lord, do you want me to bring the ark back? Would this be pleasing to you? Yes, David. Remember, here's how it's to be done. No, he just jumps into it. So David inquires of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines, and wilt thou deliver them in my hand? And the Lord said unto him, Go, go up, for I will deliver them into thine, into thine hand. You see, David here, he finally has the right response, and he's ready to learn. <clears throat> when we do things the way God has instructed us, it is God that gets the glory. When we finally learn to say, you know what, I'm just going to do the way God wants me to do it. You know, and people say, hey, good job on that. Or, and that turned out really well. How did, you did a good job there. Well, I just did it the way God wanted it done. Man, your family, they, 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 your kids are so well behaved. You guys got, you guys got such a good marriage. That's really great. Well, it's because I'm doing things the way God wants them done. And God gets the glory, doesn't He? That's what happens here in the story in verse 11. So they came up to Baal, Baal Perazim, and David smote them there. Then David said, God hath broken in upon mine enemies by my hand. He said, yeah, it was my hand, but it was God that did it. God was the one that told me to go up. God was the one that said, yeah, I will deliver them into thy hand. Like the breaking forth of waters, therefore they called the name of the place Baal Parazim. He said, by my hand. You know, we can rejoice when God works through us, but we always remember that it was God working through us. So David's got this right attitude finally. He's fearing God. When he comes up against a situation, what's he doing? He inquires of God. Should I do this? How should I do it? <clears throat> so it seems like David's got it down, right? He's learned his lesson. God tests him again. The very same, almost in the, you know, just a few verses later. Look at verse 13. And the Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. He beats them. God delivers them. He goes, and the Philistines yet again spread themselves. They come right back. It's the same enemy in the same place. And to David's credit, he has the same response. Think how easy it would have been for David at this point to say, well, we just went through this. It's the Philistines. They're in the Valley of Rephaim. We just beat them. This just happened. Of course God wants me to go up. And just had this and had that attitude to just say, hey, no problem, we got this. And not acquired of God. <clears throat> Is that my kids, Norm? Linda. She's out cold. It's past her bedtime. To David's credit, he has the same response. The Bible says in verse 14, Therefore David inquired again of God. He inquired again of God. He didn't have that attitude. He said, you know what? I still fear God. I know we're going we're gonna to whip these guys, but let me make sure. I know we just beat these guys, but let's make sure that's what God wants. Why are these guys back? And that's when God starts to deliver, I believe, his lesson. Where he starts to really drive home the fact that that God wants things done a certain way. Look what it says there in verse 14. And God said unto him, Go not up after them, turn away from them, and come up over against the mulberry trees, and it shall be when thou shalt hear 
a, a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt go out to battle. For God has gone forth before thee to smite the host of the Philistine. You see, God has a completely different method of attack, despite it being the same enemy in the same place. Why? Why is it that God chose a very different way? In fact, He said, don't go up that way. Come around this way this time. It's the same enemy in the same place. They just went through this. Why is God changing things? So that David, that David would learn, God wants things done in a specific way. David learns his lesson. And he goes up, and, he, and if we read the story, he goes up and he defeats them. He wins the battle again. He does exactly as God has said. He goes up to the mulberry trees, he listens for the sound of going, and he goes out and defeats his enemy. He inquired of God and did it exactly as he was to do. <clears throat> and David learns his lesson. If you'd look over there and, and look at uh, chapter 15, verse 1. David's going back. Now that he's learned this lesson, all of a sudden he's figured out, oh, God wants things done a certain way. Maybe we should take that and apply that knowledge to how we're going to move the ark. And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. And David said, no, not to carry the ark of God, but the Levites. Is that right? Yep. They figured it out. Oh, we just can't have these oxen dragging them on a new cart, this, the ark on a cart. It's the Levites that are supposed to do it. For them had the Lord chosen to carry the ark and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all of Israel together to Jerusalem to bring, uh, to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And to David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites of the sons of Kohath. So who does he get? He gets the Kohathites, the people that God said, they're the ones that moved the ark. So David's learned his lesson. Oh, that's why he took out Uzzah. Because God wants things that are done a certain way. Yeah, he had to go through the battle of the Philistines, but he learned his lesson that God wants things done a certain way. And he owns up uh, you know, to his mistake and, and gets it right. Like the just man that fell. He confesses it. He understands now. And he's given mercy. He owns up to his mistake. The Bible says in verse 11, And David called for Zadak and Abiathar the priest, and for the Levites, and for Uriel, and Isaiah, and Joel, and Shemaiah, and Eliel, and Aminadab, and said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of Levi. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord our God of Israel unto the place where I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. For, for that we sought him not after the due order. He's owning up. He's saying, look, I made a mistake. We messed up the first time. But now I understand that God wants things done a certain way. He wants things done after the due order. So the priests and the Levites sanctify themselves to bring the ark up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. See, he confesses his sin here in this passage and he finds mercy. And joy is restored once, once obedience is established. Once he says, you know what? I made a mistake. I messed up. Let's do it this way. Let's do it the way things God wants. Let's do it have the due order. Then they're able to have joy. And it's the same way in our life. You know, we mess up. We've been doing things the wrong way. We, figure, we find out, oh, this is how God wants it done. That's why I was having all this trouble. That's why it seemed like God was against me. That's why I had all these troubles in my life. Because I wasn't doing things the ways God wanted them done. And then we say, let me do the, now let me do them the way God wants them done. And what do we get? We get mercy. And after that, what do we get? Joy. That's when we're able to have joy in our life. When we begin to walk in the commandments and the ways of God. The Bible says in verse 25, there in that chapter, So David and the elders of, of the Israel and the captains over thousands went up to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. They weren't even afraid of what might happen because they knew they were doing it right. Don't you think they might have been a little gun shy after what happened to Uzzah? Hey, let's go get the ark. Uh, David, do you remember what happened last time? Remember what happened to Uzzah? Yeah, yeah, I know. Right? But they learned their lesson. And he's able to go get it because he, and he knows because he's doing things the way God wants them done. He's able to go there and do it with joy. Not with fear. Not having to look over his shoulder. Wonder if God's going to crack him over the head. 
Wonder if something's going to go wrong. Wonder if he's going to get punished. Because he knows he's being obedient. Because he knows what God wants. And now he's going to do it the way God wants. He's able to do it with joy. But we can apply that to so many areas of our life. However we want to, you know, you know God, you know, I pray God's moving upon your heart, speaking your heart now, but where you need to apply this lesson in your life. But one area of application I think we can apply this is in the area of soul winning. Now I've often read this passage in, in verse in, in chapter 14, where he talks about the sound of going. And man, I've always wanted to preach, I always thought that would make a great sermon title, man, the sound of going. And I've really tried to squeeze a sermon out of that phrase, but I can't. Because it's in the context of this chapter, right? And I believe that's what we need to preach, is in the context. It'd be great to just tear that out and say, the sound of going, and preach, try to preach some great soul winning sermon. And maybe one day, Lord willing, I'll be able to. But I think if we look at this, in, now, but if we look at this in the context, we can apply this lesson that we're learning here about obedience to the area of soul winning. And there are some, um, some parallels. Let me get over there to First Chronicles with you. Going the wrong way. First Chronicles chapter 14. You see, one area that where we can draw some parallels is the fact that David was told to go up. When he's listening to God, how does God want things done? When he inquired of the Lord, when he had some fear in his heart, the Bible says David was told to, to go up. Look at verse 10. Therefore, God David inquired of God, and God said unto him, uh, or verse 10, excuse me. David inquired of the Lord and saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines and will thou deliver my hand? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. Now are we not also told to go today? Are we not also told, does the Lord not tell us today to go? He does. We did that this afternoon, didn't we? We came back from lunch. We got some supplies together. We took a look at the map. And we walked out that door to go knock on some on some on the doors of our neighbors to try and preach to them the gospel. But what did it take? It took us going. It took us having to, to get up and walk out and put our feet one foot in front of the other and get out there. The Bible says in Mark 16, and he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it sounds like such a simple command, because and it is. And that's why it's so dumbfounding that so many people don't understand it. When I say people, I mean independent fundamental Baptists. People who ought to know the command of God is to go. That if they want to see souls saved, that they want to see their churches grow, they need to obey God in this area and go Amen. and preach the gospel. And, I, I, you know, and I'll never forget the time I heard an independent fundamental Baptist preacher stand up and say, God, send us a great harvest of souls. And that's what they do. They build these buildings and they say, send us souls, Lord. And God says, go! Go get the souls. They're already there. I've already sent them. They're waiting for you. You're the one who has to go. But people, and, they, and, they, and they'll say up and down, one side down the other, well, we're not Calvinists, but God send us the souls. Oh, if, they, if they're supposed to get saved, they will. That's Calvinism, buddy. You know, creeping into your heart. And, and, and putting a wet blanket on your soul winning, on your evangelism, the clear command is to go. So that's the first parallel we can see in this passage. David was told to go. We need to learn the obedience here, that God wants things done a certain way in soul winning. And one of the ways that God things, wants things done in soul winning is for us to get up and go. And would to God that, the, that the, the Baptist churches in Tucson and Phoenix and Arizona and this country and yeah, the world would understand this, this one command, to go. <clears throat> Notice also in this area, this parallel I want to draw here, that David was also told to turn away, wasn't he? Look at verse uh, 14. Therefore David acquired, this is after the, the Philistines come back up again, right? Therefore David inquired again of the Lord, and God said unto him, Go not up after them. Turn away from them. And come not, and come not, up, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. Here he's telling them retreat. He's saying, no, don't go up that way. He's saying, turn away from them. Come up another way. You know, we're also told to depart in certain circumstances. You know, once we go out there, we're going to run into people that God wants us to depart from. We're going to run into people if we're obedient to that first man to go out and go and knock on doors. 
We're going to have some people open those doors. There's going to be some people standing on the other side of that door that God expects us to turn away from. That God wants us to go away from and come up another way and go knock on another door. You know, the Bible is very clear about this. Matthew 10, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when he depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. God says, if there's some city that doesn't want to hear what you have to say, don't even let the dust of their city cling to your feet. Have nothing to do. Don't. You know, and, and we can really apply that in soul winning. This is something I think, especially early on in my soul winning uh, you know, career, or whatever you want to call it, uh, is, is shaking off the dust. It's one thing to say, you know, okay, I'm going to leave this. I, you know when you should leave the house. But then you walk away and you're constantly thinking about it. You have some bad experience, some cantankerous jerk at a door. You say, ah, oh, you shouldn't be here. This is trespassing. Well, how did you get in here? How did you, you, there, there's a lock on that gate. <laughs> and you can say, you know what? We're going to go. And you leave. And you leave well. Maybe even you don't even get upset. But it's in the back of your mind. And you're thinking about, oh, what a jerk. Oh, this guy. Yeah. Those type of experiences, and this is a good soul winning tip, try as hard as you can to put, immediately put that person out of your mind and move on to the next door. Always keep in front of you the fact that there's somebody out there that wants to hear it. That if Amen. you go long enough and you knock long enough and you speak long enough, you're going to find somebody Amen. who's going to say yes. Yes, I want to hear. Preach me the gospel. And they're going to receive it. So don't let the jerk at the door, don't let that dust of that guy that doesn't want to hear your words cling to your feet, cling to the, the you know, the, in your mind, cloud up your mind. God tells us to leave certain people. But when they were persecute you in this city, flee you into another. Don't stick around. No. What good does that do the work of God to sit there and argue with somebody? No. For verily I say unto you, you shall not go into the city of Israel to the Son of Man become. Titus chapter 3, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, give four, five, or six more admonitions to. Is that what it says? It says reject him. The guy who does it just wants to argue and start throwing out just all these stupid, ridiculous arguments and is a heretic and is spewing blasphemy. And let me just be real clear what I mean by this. I'm not talking about a safe, an unsaved person who's just not getting it. That's not a heretic. That's not what I'm saying. Well, I tried to preach this guy the gospel once or twice. I have this family member that I preach the gospel to and they're just not getting it. They don't want to get saved. That doesn't mean they're a heretic. It's when they start saying things like, well, you know, I believe that Jesus and the devil are the same person. Or that they're brothers, like the Mormons believe. They start just spouting out some heresy. That's a heretic. Yeah. That's the guy that you reject. You know, I can think of a guy that was out soul winning, you know, a few weeks back. Knocked on his door. Said, yeah, go ahead, give me what you got. Started taking it through Romans. Got into the deity of Christ. Well, well Jesus and the, and the devil are the same person. Gave him a few scriptures. Gave him one, gave him another one a little more sternly, and then I just told him, look, what you believe is wrong. The Bible is clear that Jesus is God and that Satan and the devil are not God. That they... And I just gave him a real stern rebuke, and I politely said, have a nice day, sir. I have to go. I didn't sit there and argue. See, God expects that God wants things done a certain way. In this area of soul winning, God does not want us to stand there and argue with people. He says, reject them. Give them a couple of admonitions and then get out of there. Amen. He that is such subverteth and sinneth being condemned of himself. He's condemned of himself. There's nothing you're going to say to, to sway him. Another thing that we of application here we can make from this passage in 1 Chronicles 14 about how God wants things done in the area of soul winning. God was told to look for God. David was told to look for God's moving. You look there in verse 15. And it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then thou shalt go out to battle. For God has gone forth before thee to smite the hosts of the Philistines. God will so wait until I move. When you know that I'm with you and you see me moving, then you'll know that I'm with you. You know, we should look when we go out, you know, we pray. When we pray before we go soul winning, one of the things we pray and ask is, God, go out before us. I pray that your spirit would touch the hearts of the people that we're going to speak to. And that you would guide us to those doors that would be receptive. And that you'd help us to quickly depart from those doors that would not be receptive. We should look for the spirit to move upon 
and sway the hearts of those that we preach the gospel to. And a lot of times I think people need to look for this while they're preaching the gospel to somebody. You know, I've seen people, be, they'll, be, they'll be deep into their gospel presentation, the person's just like, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Half paying attention. Be very careful with teenagers about this. Because teenagers and young people often, they're still too shy to say, no, I don't want to hear what you have to say. They'll go ahead and say, yeah, go ahead. Because they, they're awkward. They don't know how to say no to an adult sometimes. Often, in fact. So that I've, and I've done it myself. When I start preaching, you know, I'm ten minutes into a gospel, five, ten minutes into a gospel presentation, where it finally dawns on me, this kid has, does not care at all what I'm saying. They want to go back to their... Insta Twitter and their, you know, all the everything else they're into, and they don't want anything to do with me. And I'll ask them sometimes. So when I, uh, what I do now, if I sense at all that a, that a young person is just giving me a yes because they're too shy to say no, I'll say, "Are you sure?" I said, "There's nothing wrong with saying no. I really want to preach this to you." And then I'll say, "No," because here's the thing. You say, "Well, you should preach it anyway." They don't want to hear it. The Spirit of God isn't, isn't moving on their heart. They're not allowing that to be, they're not allowing themselves to be swayed. They're, ha they're not even there with you. They're not listening. Why would you waste your time there? Why would we sit there and say, well, you know, I want to plant a seed? You know, give them a verse. Say, hey, you know, I'm going to go, but I want you to think about this one verse. You probably do more with one verse in that circumstance. Give them one thing to think about than to sit there and go try to go through the whole, your, the whole thing when they're half listening and they're half getting it. Because by the time you get to the end, you start asking questions, they're going to give you all the wrong answers. And you just wasted all that time. We should be looking for the moving of God's Spirit when we're preaching to these people. <clears throat> you know, I just I really love the, the language in that verse. It says when you hear the, the sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees. I've often thought about that verse when I've been out soul winning. And I'll be the silent partner sometimes. I can think of more than one instance where I've been just list, seeing somebody, you know, attentively just paying attention, hanging on to every word of some soul winner, and he's preaching them the gospel, and you can hear the rustling of the leaves of the Bible, and it reminds me of the Spirit, you know, just moving, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, moving upon those trees and the story, and you can start to see them, the, the, the heart, their hearts begin to sway and bend as they start to you know, become tender to the things of God and understand the things of God, become convicted about the things of God by the Spirit of God. It's a really it's it's really something to sit there and see that happen. To see the Spirit of God move upon somebody's heart through the power of the gospel. Not through the power of the wisdom of our own words, not through our own clever illustrations, not through our own assertive personalities, but by simply opening up this book and showing them. And watching God move through His Word and sway their hearts. It's powerful. It's amazing. It gets me every time I see it. <clears throat> Jesus said in verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hast, hearest not the sound thereof. But can't, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh and where it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And we should seek to know and obey God's commands. In this area of soul winning, you know, go. First off, you know, we, I think we drove that point home. Go. You know, and know when not and when to leave. And, when, and know how to look for the moving of, of, of God, moving uh, His Spirit moving upon these people. Are they with you? Are they with you as you present the gospel? Or are they just half-heartedly listening? We should know and to seek and, God's, and obey God's commands in all areas of life, not just soul winning. You know, and, and really I was thinking about this. Life really isn't that complicated. You know, in all the areas of life. You know, and as we grow older, there's just it seems like life is compartmentalized into just some, some big categories. Church family, work, you know, what in these areas are we should, where we should allow uh, God to instruct us what it is that He wants, how we should conduct ourselves to be uh, obedient to God's commandments in these areas. Because here's the thing, ignorance is not an excuse. I didn't know, God. Sorry. Well, 
did you have a Bible? Did you have the Spirit living in you? Did you have a preacher? Did you have godly friends? Did you have, did you have an opportunity to pray? Ignorance is not an excuse. You can't say, well, I, I didn't know God. Why are you punishing me? You should have known. Uzzah might, not, Uzzah might not have known better. Uzzah might not have known, hey, it's not for me to be moving the ark. I certainly shouldn't be touching it. But did that God change God's mind when his hand reached out and touched the ark? Oh, Uzzah doesn't know any better. It's not his fault. He should have known. David should have known. You know, it's interesting in that story, you never see David. And then David got out the book of Numbers and read in the law where it says that none but the Kohathites should move the ark. It just says in the next chapter, after he fights the Philistines and learns that lesson, none but the Kohathites, the Levites, sons of Levi, should move the ark. I tend to think that, Le that he already knew that. And maybe he had forgotten. I mean, we don't see in the story where he, where he learns that knowledge. He just knows it all of a sudden in, verse 15, in chapter 15. But even so, ignorance is not an excuse. And if you aren't ignorant, if you do know these things, of how, to, where you, how you ought to conduct yourself and obey the Lord and what His commandments are and what He expects, that makes you all the more accountable. The Scripture doesn't state that, you know, that, that David learned how to move the ark after the death of Uzzah, but he knew somehow. You see, when we know what it is that we're supposed to do, we're more accountable. Jesus in the parable of the servant said, And that servant which knew his Lord's will, he knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. He's going to get a sore punishment. But he that knew not, the guy that was ignorant, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. You know, ignorance is not an excuse, but you might get a little bit slacker punishment. Well, who likes getting punished at all? I mean, the options aren't just many stripes and few stripes. You know, there's also the option of no stripes. What if we just did the things that God wants us If we know what God wants us to do and we just did them, then we could do those things and have joy in our life and know that we're being obedient to God's commandments and that God can bless us. I hope that's been a blessing to us. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the clear instructions that we have from it. Lord, help every one of us to take heed to our ways, Lord, as we read the Bible, as we gain knowledge, as we understand and grow and know more about your will and what it is you want for us to do in this life and how we ought to live to be pleasing to you. Help every one of us to take heed. And Lord, help us to seek to please you in all areas of our life. And Lord, if there's something we don't know, if there's some area of life that we're not sure what it is you would have us to do, help us to inquire of you. Help us to go and seek your face and to seek your will and your word, to know what it is that we ought to do, so that we wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of disobedience, which are sure to come. Father, I pray that you bless everyone here this evening. Thank you for them. Help us all to go back uh, safely to our homes, and that we will be back this uh, Thursday for a midweek service. We love you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.